The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. Welcome to the Quirky Dog Podcast, inspired by some of the quirkiest dogs you can ever imagine and the owners who love them. This podcast is brought to you by the quirky couple themselves, Scott and Jess Williams. Their aim is to educate and entertain. Here's Scott and Jess. Welcome, guys. Here we are today, and we are going to talk about the importance of crating. This is an important topic for us, and it should become an important topic for you as well. But first, we're going to start out with the quirky tip of the day. How's it going, guys? Uh, quirky tip of the day, uh, we're recommending the Primo pad for using in the crate. Um, it could be used out of the crate also, but we use them in the crates and they're made uh, custom sizes. But these, what we like about them is that they are about as indestructible as you could ever get for a dog bed in a crate. And uh, like many of you out there, I've gone through dozens of dog beds with one particular dog that he'd be good with his bed for three weeks. And then the next time you go in there, there's just fluff everywhere and it's torn to shreds. And then I'd get some ballistic one or this or that that's supposed to be indestructible. He would tear that up. These are made out of, I don't... I think it's know, a roofing material. I Yeah, I used to be a roofer. And I think that this is a, a roofing, a vinyl roofing material with insulation inside it. And um, it's awesome. And we that being said, uh, they guarantee them that they're indestructible. And we have had uh, a dog that has torn a hole in one of the two dogs yeah, have ripped holes in them our but, personal dogs of but course. we've had hundreds of dogs with these things and they come in all sizes so we brought of course a big one here this is just for a big normal sized dog crate and then this is for our little toy dog and it was just easy to bring and show you guys comes in all different colors blue red white green uh gray black whatever you want but it's a pretty cool product i really i really like it i don't so think it comes in white or gray but all the other colors are available Purple. Ask for white. It comes in purple. And then um, <laughs> also they're really easy to clean. I love that. You can just put them right, uh, bleach them, whatever else, and they're easy to clean. No washing machine or anything else. And if your dog does ruin it for some reason, let's put the pig on. Yeah, they will primo. replace it if They'll it gets damaged. They'll replace it and they have a little bit uh, more indestructible one. So it's a good alternative and it's nice if you use a crate, which we recommend you do, that your dog has something to lay on that they can't ingest and then maybe get an obstruction so from or something else. So if you'd else. like more information on these, primopads.com. They have pricing, sizes, all that stuff. They can get them right off to you or delivered right to the house. Yep. Made in the USA. Guys in Florida. He's super nice. Jerry. Okay. So crating. Well, first of all, we want to talk about what types of crates there are. And nowadays, as we know with everything that's commercialized in the dog industry, there's a lot of different types of crates and a lot of different crates that you can spend your money on. So there's roto mold crates. Uh, those are like the Roughland kennels that we've talked about before. Uh, there's so, diamond plate crates. Yeah, it's a one solid injected plastic crate. There's soft crates. Uh, we really like those for traveling. They're easy to fold up, bring in, bring out. They're not as heavy. There's very kennels. That's your typical plastic crate at your big box pet stores. You can get them on Chewy's, whatever else, where they have that uh, wire door on the front but it's made of plastic all around. There's wire crates. And then now you can get literally custom furniture that's a crate. So it just kind of blends into your living room, but matches the wood and the look and feel of your house. And yeah. that can nice be a crate as well. The nice thing about the wire crates is they fold up almost flat. So when you're not using it, you can fold it up and put it in the garage or put it behind a couch or something like that. Yeah, but there's a million different types of crates, almost like uh, Bubba Gump's shrimp <laughs> recipes. <laughs> just like Forrest Gump. Um, the thing about crates, and we're not going to touch on this a ton, um, about dogs getting out of crates. We'll talk about dogs not accepting the crates, but if you have a dog that has previously escaped a crate before, a wire crate and a very kennel and a soft crate and a really expensive furniture crate, those aren't going to be your best options. Okay. You don't want to go spend a few hundred or a few thousand dollars on this custom cabinet crate that now your dog has chewed through in the first day. The wire crates aren't super safe. It's easy for the dogs to push those doors open. You can put some clips on the outside of them. You can zip tie the different sides of them to keep them there, but they're not great for a dog who is an escape artist and who has successfully previously broken out of a crate. The very kennels, they're getting made more and more cheaply. Uh, a lot of dogs that are destructive can chew through one of those very kennels. Um, 
and those doors, they can pop the doors off in the front and everything else. So what we would recommend if your dog is accustomed to being an escape artist and has been successful in breaking out of crates in the past, we recommend you look at Roughland Kennels. Um, there's gunner crates. Roughland is the most affordable crate. Uh, they have a plastic door, like a composite plastic door, not the wire door that you can just pop open. Um, and, uh, the other crates, the pricing goes up from there as far as that goes, but you want to look into a crate that is going to successfully contain your dog and a crate that is $200 or less is likely not going to do that. Can I add something to that? Of course, love. If you have a traditional wire crate, they're really flimsy, but it's amazing how much strength you can add to a typical wire crate. If you put four zip ties on the top four corners so that the front and back panel is actually secured to the top. And then if you take your leash, the bolt snap on the end of the leash, and you clip it on the door so it's an extra lock on that front door, they really, really uh, are so much more secure than just popping that thing open, throwing your dog in there, and your dog has broken out of it repeatedly in the past. We have this running joke that I'll say something, and then Scott will say something, Did and you then when Scott says something, I know you said it. Oh, wow, what right a revelation! I wanted to um, put a little emphasis on that. <laughs> it is important. Zip ties and bolt snaps. Um, the only thing about that is, if you're going to use the leash, don't let the leash be able to get pulled into the crate. Have the leash so it's coming out of the crate, so the dog can't pull it in. So, whatever crate you're going to use, make sure it is going to contain your dog, because if the dog is successful getting out of the crate once. The dog is They're successful try. getting out of the crate twice. It becomes more and more dangerous to use a crate over time. And this yeah. is the... They will hurt themselves trying to get out because they think they can. Yeah. And this yeah. is a situation that we get into more and more and more. So um, I would say our worst crate anxiety is a side note ever was that Doberman um, that had its own room. Yeah. It was a Hannibal Lecter room they built yeah. in the basement for this dog. And when they took me down there, there was blood on the walls and it was a real... It was bad. Um, Scary little scene. And we were able to successfully create that dog in... Um, I did see girls' fingernails embedded oh, in the wall, up. too. It wasn't that kind of show. <laughs> we're watching you on Netflix right now, so we have all kinds of dark stuff going on in our heads. Um, it was... We did use a rough tough. It was a rough tough was the company then, not rough land for that dog. But the door was still um, a wire door, so we actually had to keep the dog away from accessing the door because he still could have yeah. popped the door off. I but, reinforced the door with yeah. some... We welded some yeah. iron on it and stuff. Scott's yeah. brother is an artist, so we went down to his shop and did some stuff. But really, for the most part, it isn't that hard to contain um, dogs. Actually, that isn't the worst case. The worst case was a little Italian greyhound, and that dog did live in an X-Pen in our kitchen. That was the only dog in 10 years that yeah. we absolutely didn't create. It was going to break its teeth trying to bite yeah, on the door. Yeah, it was like chicken pecking the door and then tore through a few soft crates, and it was Christmas, so we just said, there you go, here's an X-Pen. But for the most part, if your dog doesn't like the crate, you can get them to accept the crate. Yeah, I mean, if you condition your dog to a crate in the first place, you won't have any of these issues that we're talking about. We're talking about uh, dogs with extreme an extreme aversion to being crated for because they've been able to get out of it in the past through crying or ki you know kicking and screaming, whatever. So now the crate has become you know completely unacceptable to them. But the first thing we do is just feed the dog's meals in the crate and, and build a positive association to going in there. Yeah, know? and ideally it's the dog is choosing to go into the crate and then the meal is following. You're not luring <laughs> the dog into the crate with the meal. You're not putting it in first and then kind of getting them, shoving them in and then closing the door as a rabbit trap. Um, you can feed them a few times with the door open, but the dog should accept eating its meal in the crate with the door closed. And tons of people use crates for potty training. They don't want their floors to get ruined. They don't want their carpets to get ruined, everything else. As soon as the potty training is on lock, if the dog cries once in the crate, they're like, oh, we had to get rid of the crate. He didn't like it anymore. Well, yeah. And I will say, if you're doing your proper... Um, your proper research of getting a small crate when the dog is small and then buying crates as the dog progresses in size. Yeah, at some point you're going to say, all right, well, I don't want to buy another crate, so now the dog's just loose in the house. But if the dog can accept being crated, it gives you so many advantages over a dog that is going to throw a hissy pissy bitch fit in the crate. Crating is really important and it's something nice to fall back on as a management tool, as a safety tool when the dog is riding in the car and everything else. Yeah, we were discussing this, uh, I think it was last night, about when people started using crates in this country. And uh, the research I did, uh, they first started crating dogs in World War II, sending military dogs, putting them on planes. And then when commercial airlines uh, really started kicking into high gear, which was the end of the 50s, early 60s, they needed a crate to move dogs around on these airlines. 
And that's when these very kennels and these products became mass produced and started to be used. But when I was a kid in the 60s and 70s, nobody used crates. They were available, but none of us used them. All my buddies had dogs. We had puppies. They'd poop all over my bedroom floor. They would chew up my shoes. But the way we handled dogs then was also very different. They just were left outside. I mean, dogs got kicked outside all the time. Whenever we didn't want a dog under our feet, the dog was just put outside. And dogs got hit by cars and you know, uh, they were just treated differently than they are today. So uh, laws were different. Many things were different than they are. And, but having raised dogs with crates and raised dogs without, I would say that creating a dog and training a dog to accept a crate is the only way to go. It's a great way to do it. Yeah, you want the dog to be able to adapt to whatever you throw its way. And we're going to talk about the benefits of crating after the break, but we are just becoming less and less, um, we're, we're able, we're unable to implement control as a society, especially as it comes to our dogs. Sometimes when it comes to our kids, oftentimes when it comes to ourselves, I mean, just this lack of being able to, I have to, no control. That's, that's true. <laughs> yeah. That's why you had to marry a dog trainer. The lack of being able to uh, just teach their dogs to accept some adversity in society is really amazing with owners. I was on a thread the other day on Facebook and um, somebody had gotten a Cavalier King Charles and the Cavalier King Charles breed like Facebook page was saying, oh, this breed can't be created. They're prone to separation anxiety. At what point have we gotten to now that we say, oh, this breed can't accept being created. Any dog should be able to accept anything you throw its way. And the more things that the dog can accept and deal with, the more well-rounded your dog is going to be, the healthier they're going to be in the mind, the healthier they're going to be with their physical health, their immune systems are going to be stronger. Just like people, you want dogs to be able to deal with a lot of different stuff without just completely losing it. And I've heard several other breeds that are not creatable either. That's the Weimaraners, too much anxiety to be created, this dog, that dog. The bottom line is there's anxiety now in yeah. every breed and every rescue. It is rampant. That is what's happening. There's anxiety with people. There's anxiety with dogs. And one major way to help anxiety is by crating. I'd well, say there's three different structure, ways. Structure. Yeah, th yeah. The three ways that we would go through it are teaching a dog to get on a bed, um, you know, limiting its movement by stepping on the leash, tethering and everything else, and then crating. Those are the three main ways to combat anxiety and get to get a dog to accept a crate and everything else. So if you think, oh, well. And that's, a, that's a trainer's perspective. The veterinary perspective is Medicaid and, or the behaviorists would be Medicaid. That's the way that they're dealing with anxiety. Yeah. And if that's working, awesome. Please send us. Some, yeah. Let us know. Yeah. We are all about whatever works. If CBD works, let us know. If uh, medication works, let us know. If crating works, let us know. We want to know what's working for you because at the end of the day, that's all that matters. In our decades of experience, the medications and these different ways, these other workarounds aren't working as well as just getting the dog to accept being in a crate. And the easiest way is the first night that rescue comes home, you're getting them crate trained. The first week that puppy comes home, you're getting the dog crate trained. And then you're continuing that. It doesn't have to be every day of its life, but if your dog sleeps in bed with you, that dog should accept being crated one night a week. Just because you wanted it to, just because you're trying to throw your dog off its game and you want to make sure it's accepting that. Scott's dog, Jimmy, sleeps in bed with us, I would say at least four to five nights a week. <laughs> Scott, we both love it. But if he's in a crate and he's now whining overnight in a crate, he's going to spend a lot more nights in a crate uh, throughout the week. It, it's not that we're anti-dogs being out. It's that okay. they need to accept when things change and things should change based on your conditions, not on yeah. the dog's condition. Yeah, my dog, Jimmy, has got such a strong positive association with the crate that we have to keep him out of the crate, keep the door locked, yeah. because <laughs> he will default. If we can't find him, where is he? He ran back in his crate. <laughs> All right, guys, after the break, we're going to talk about some of the benefits of crating and how it can benefit your household and your dog. Does your dog seem anxious? Would you like your dog to relax? Do you want to feel more in control? Would you like your dog to cooperate? HowToCalmYourCanine.com That's HowToCalmYourCanine.com
Okay, guys, we're back, and uh, I want to talk about some of the practical uses of crating. Of course, you know, we want the dog to have the structure of being able to go in a crate and um, be accepting of the crate. And a time when it's great to be able to use a crate is when you're having company over, and uh, the company may have a kid or maybe one of your friends is not comfortable around dogs. It's nice to be able to be a good host and put your dogs away. And I do this quite often because... People are crazy and they do stupid crap and I don't want them to be messing with my dogs, especially if there's drinking. If you guys are having some wine, uh, I can't tell you how many times I've had uh, people over and they'll start drinking and next thing you know, they're like Caesar Milan. They're getting my dog, they're trying to get him to do all kinds of stuff. My dog is trying to, you know, looking at me like, what the hell's wrong with this person? And I'll put my dog away. So uh, when people come over to visit, it's a good time. Or even if you have the dog out, you know, but then the dog is getting a little bit overstimulated. Maybe this kid's running around. You can see your dog is just looking a little bit stressed. It's better to be proactive and put your dog away rather than reactive because your dog now has done something negative that you didn't want to happen. And now it's becoming a punishment because your dog barked at a kid or, God forbid, nipped at somebody, and now you're dragging them off to the crate. Be proactive. Put them in the crate before things can spiral downhill. And um, if you just use it, when company comes over, the dog's going to protest. Like, you have to prep for these things. You have to practice these things. You have to make this become part of the dog's little arsenal of techniques that it accepts. So a lot of the times, um, this anxiety manifests itself worst, I would say, with people who work from home. So uh, because the dog's with the owner all the time, you know, the person's working from home. And then on top of that, if the dog's crated and barking and they're on a conference call, now they're working from home and having to deal with that stress. So, of course, the dog is just out at their feet or, you know, maybe on their lap getting pet, whatever it is, they give them a bone. So for those people, our loose recommendations were create your dog an hour a day when you're home, have your dog accept that, feed the dog its meals in the crate, and have your dog sleep in the crate overnight. And just that regular uh, structure and control helped those dogs to accept the crate more. We understand if you work all day and you just have dog walkers come by and the dog's crated during the day because it can't be trusted loose in the house and crating it overnight is a lot of crating. But when you're home on the weekend, sometimes... If you're off on the weekends, throw the dog in the crate for an hour. Dogs need to accept being crated when you're home just as much as they need to be ex accepting crating when you're away from the house or overnight while everyone's sleeping. Yeah, I really think it's much less of an issue for the dogs than it is for the owners. You know, the, the dogs are kind of a reflection of our stress, our anxiety, how we feel about something. So if you put a dog in a crate in a very matter-of-fact way, they're, you know, they're just going to sleep in the crate. Especially if you're feeding them the meals in yeah, the crate. Yeah, if you put them in the else. crate and you say, oh, I'm so sorry, I have to do this to you and go on and on and on. The dog starts thinking, what the hell is wrong? There's something wrong with this situation and I shouldn't be here. And oftentimes if a dog has a crate and the door is left open, they choose to go in the crate themselves. They like the retreat. They like the space. If there's a thunderstorm, they go to their crate for safety. They like that. They like to have their own personal space. And with that said, um, 100%, if you have small children or something like that, please do not allow your children to follow the dog into the crate. That is not fair. Same thing goes if you teach a bed exercise. That is the dog space. The kids don't need to be crawling all over the dog there. It's not fair to have dogs in a place that they can't get away and now, you know, children yeah, following You should have a separate else. crate for the kids. <laughs> God, that's a separate <laughs> podcast altogether. Another way crates are great is when you're traveling. We are huge advocates of crating the dogs in the car. The seatbelts seem like, oh, that's so great, everything else. If you slam on the brakes or if you get T-boned by another vehicle, those dogs are not safe in the car in an accident. You don't want the dog flying through the windshield. You don't want the dog loose. You don't want the dog to you be... You don't want the dog to hit you in the head. Yeah, you know, and you don't driving. want the dog to be loose on the highway if, you know, all of a sudden the door busts open or something else. So crating in the car is really nice. A lot of the crates aren't going to hold up well. Good travel crates we've mentioned before, and I'll mention it again, are the Roughland Kennels. We have them in each of our cars, and they're pretty safe, and they've withstood a lot of crash tests, so those are good things to consider. And then using, um, having your dog accept a crate for daycare is really important. We have a really good friend out in New York, and this was almost part of um, how this podcast was birthed. The barking lot. <laughs> yes. And she got an email um, a few weeks ago, and said the person said, hello, we are in search of a daycare for our pup. 
He's two and a half, been before, but we're looking for one that works better for us. He's a rescue, relatively shy, but well-behaved. Hope and ask you a few qu- uh, questions. Do you offer a trial day to see how he integrates? Hopefully, if you're choosing a daycare, they Anything do offer that. Anything about crates in there? Love. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Go ahead. Next question was, are the dogs constantly supervised even during pickup and drop off? That's a time when the dogs are getting stimulated and fights can break out and everything else. Legitimate question. And then third question, and this is what she gets over and over and over and over and over and over again from all of these new prospects that want to come to our daycare. Do you utilize crates? How does it work if the dogs that are afraid of crates? Unfortunately, our dog was afraid of one since we adopted him. We tried our best to work with him, but ultimately, he's just so well-behaved roaming around the house that he didn't need it. Well, newsflash, you guys. If you're going to a daycare that doesn't have structured rest time, and oftentimes that structured rest time is in crates, you should not be using that daycare. Just like kids, dogs need to decompress. They can't just be going, 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 going all day. That's when they get frustrated. That's when these fights break out, everything else. Downtime is important for daycares. So if you want to utilize a daycare, your dog should accept crating for daycare. The vet's office, if your dog has to go in for a procedure, the dog is not going to be living loose in the vet's office. The dog is not going to be in an X-Pen back there. All the dogs are in crates. If your dog comes home now in a cone and has follow-up protocols from a procedure or a surgery or an injury or something else, you're going to want to crate your dog. Do you know what it's like to have a dog walking around the house in a cone and then it knocks over your $5,000 vase because the cone was, you know, in the way the dogs can't handle that. I They're can't not tell you how many that. times that's happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We own a lot of $5,000 vases with our crew of dogs. Well, the thing is, if your dog is not, doesn't do well in a crate and it needs surgery or something like that, uh, and has to stay at the vet, they're just going to medicate the heck out of it. So it's just sleeping in the crate all the time because it can't mentally handle being in a crate. So you don't want your dog to be medicated all the time either, you know? Or ideally, you shouldn't want to have to subject your dog to that. And at home, it's just not that practical. If you have, you know, a dog gets spayed, there's an incision. Okay, fine, you're going to leave them loose in the kitchen. If they're stretching their legs up on the counter to see if anything's on the counter when you're gone during the day, that's not safe for the surgical site. Like, you need to be thoughtful about these kind of things. Dogs need to accept crates. Uh, My 18-year-old terrier, when the cleaning ladies would come, we would put her in a crate. To this day, if we needed to... It, well, she's not with us any longer, but to the point when we lost her, if she needed to be crated for some reason, she'd go on the crate and she'd sleep. The dog probably wasn't crated for an entire year of her life at some points, but it's just important that they say, okay, that's fine. You want this? I'll do it for you. And then another thing that I was thinking about um, is dogs that are destructive, especially dogs that are going to swallow something, you want them to be able to accept crates. You're, they're not going to be able to swallow a sock or you know, chew up the sofa and ingest part of the sofa if they're in a crate. So a crate is important from that practical standpoint too. And the funny thing is if the dog has destroyed couches and carpets and, you know, a bunch of expensive stuff in the house, then all of a sudden people are a lot more open to crating. No, but they're more open to getting rid of the dog is what well, happens. that also depends on the person. But yeah. you want to think of crating as a safety measure for the dog. And the more readily accepting they are of the crate, the more flexibility you and your dog have. If you ever fly your dog on an airline, they need to be in a crate. If they're under the seat, they're in a crate. If they're under the plane, they're in a crate. You don't want the first time the dog to be in a crate in five years to be when it's underneath the freaking belly of an airplane. That's even more stressful for it. You want the dog to just deal with whatever's thrown its way and take it in stride. We don't want the dog now to have diarrhea for three days because it's in a crate. If your dog's not used to being crated and you go back to feeding the dog its meal in the crate, it may not eat dinner. Take dinner away. If you offer breakfast, offer breakfast in the crate. If it doesn't eat breakfast, dinner the next day. Just work them through it rather than think, oh, he doesn't seem happy. We're going to back off because all of these little scenarios happen and it's important. And dogs with fear aggression, especially with dog walkers and everything else, crating is a lot safer for a person to be able to come over to the house and guide a dog out of a crate with a leash or something than have the dog just you know, bouncing off the door or retreating into the corner or something else. So maybe everything's fine and good with your life. What if you broke your leg, you need somebody else to go and take care of your dog. It's safer for that person to be able to deal with your dog, uh, when it's in a crate than just loose running around and having free run of the house. Yeah. You know, and it's with adult dogs. I mean, there's obviously exceptions to the rule, but, um, getting back to the daycare again, Uh, We have another good friend in Massachusetts that has a daycare and they create the dogs midday for an hour 
and she told me that she had a client that was very upset that they were creating the dog, that they were paying for daycare and they wanted that dog out playing all the time and not being in a crate. And if you don't create your dog at home, but you're going to a daycare where they are crating, consider them doing you a favor. You know, they're kind of getting your dog acclimated to a crate. The dogs are probably much more likely to accept the crate at the daycare because they're tired. They've been running around all morning and they really do need a break. So they go in there and they all crash and they're getting into this routine of using a crate. So don't feel like it's like you're getting cheated out of some daycare time if they're crating at daycare because really they're just creating some structure. And the more structure uh, that they can balance with the play, the better the experience the dog is going to have at the daycare. Yeah, and if that dog accepts being created at daycare like a dream and sleeps and all the other dogs sleep, and then you bring the dog home and you try to put the dog in the crate and it whines incessantly, that's telling with the relationship that you have with the dog also. You kind of want to even that out so the dog understands that it can be in a crate at home and deal with it also rather than rush and let it out or a lot of people assume the dog has to pee or something else. Potty your dog, put him in a crate, offer the food in the crate, Take the bowl out if it doesn't eat within five minutes and let the dog be in there for half an hour. You know, these things are important. Dogs, the more well-rounded dogs are, the more likely they are going to be able to stay in the homes that they're in. Oh, I, I, sorry to interrupt you, but if emotionally you're having a harder time with crating your dog than your dog does with accepting the crate themselves, DM me through Facebook because also for you guys, I could, um, there are some uh, techniques, some things to help you uh, kind of get over these things in your mind also, some little energy techniques and things like that that may be able to help you that are just no charge, it's not something I'm trying to sell you, but some little techniques that could help you maybe get over that hump too. Yeah, because a lot of times this, you know, trauma comes from something that happened in childhood and people are perceiving crates yeah. to yeah, be... Maybe your parents kept you in a crate, <laughs> now you don't want your dog to be in a crate. <laughs> we joke about it from our all angles, Scott's kids in crates, you were in a crate, but no, really, uh, these... This is just basic stuff, guys. This is basic stuff that dogs are in crates. They accept being in crates. Working dogs accept being in crates every single day. Uh, dogs that are in a vet's office are crated. Dogs that are in a shelter are at least contained by a kennel, oftentimes a crate. This is okay. They can they they need their own space, just like us. Isn't it nice sometimes to go into your office and not deal with anybody else or have a bath at night and just have it be your own time or go out on the porch and have a cigar? Yes. Dogs like that too. They need their own space. So think about that. Think of the benefits of the crate. And we're not saying crate your dog 24 seven for the rest of its life, but you want to know, Hey, the dog whines if I crate it while I'm home right now. Hey, the dog chooses not to eat its meal. If it's in a crate with a locked door, when the dog sleeps in a crate overnight, it keeps us up all night. Where is the, where's the weak link? Because you can strengthen it. Just reprogram the dog, get it used to it. And we're totally fine with the dog sleeping in bed. We're totally fine with the dog being out all day when you work from home. But if you choose to create the dog for one reason or another, and hopefully it's just for the greater good of the dog, you want the dog to just say, okay, no big deal, and sleep in the crate just as it would at the foot of the bed or at your feet underneath your desk. Yeah. I mean, it's nice just from the practical side of it. If you're having contractors over painting the inside of the house or cleaning carpets, you can put your dog in a crate. You can even leave the, the building, leave the property. And know that the dog isn't going to slip out the front door and go running down the street because these guys are actually trying to do their job and not babysit your dog. And they may need to be moving things in and out. The dog didn't get closed and you don't want the dog running down the street. Yeah, and pet-friendly hotels are almost a thing of the past because everybody's using and abusing that um, to the 10th degree. But if you're at a hotel and you're going to go have breakfast downstairs, your dog should be in a crate. Even if you have that do not disturb sign on the door. What if the cleaning ladies walked in? You don't want the dog running up and down the aisle now and all this stuff. So you want the dog to be able to accept the crate for its own well-being and for your convenience, okay? You got to be thoughtful of those $5,000 vases. <laughs> all right, guys, uh, we will see you next week. Thanks so much for joining us here today. If you have any questions or need any input about anything, studio at thequirkydog.com. And in the meantime, keep it quirky. <coughs> The views and opinions expressed by the hosts, guests, or callers of this program do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, the United Podcast Network, its partners or affiliates.